for bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Ah, thank you very much, Ollie Barrett. Thank you. How you doing? It's a Friday afternoon. It's a beautiful afternoon in the northwest of the country. I'm delighted to be with you. It's just after 3 p.m. BBG, of course, you can tweet me. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Bit of drive time for you today. Yeah, not done that for a while. It's the BBG, not the BBC. You're listening to the Richie Allen Radio Show, live from Salford in Greater Manchester. There won't be any serious jocking either. Don't worry about that. None of that nonsense, eh? It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Ah, back in my drive time days, round about now I would be telling you the weather forecast. God be with the days. How ya? I'm great, I've already told you that. Gonna play a few tunes over the next hour, maybe 90 minutes, got a few tunes. And we'll have a look at today's COVID bollocks. That's what we'll do, today's COVID bollocks. CB, it's a CB show today. Yeah. Oh, it's lovely. A little bit cooler, but it's lovely. Lovely today. And apparently the outlook is good for the weekend in the Northwest in general. But, 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 as you heard, as you heard in the news there, in the new oct, in the new oct, as we call it, in God's country, new restrictions for most of Lancashire and West Yorkshire even, will come in next Tuesday. New restrictions for most of Lancashire and West Yorkshire will come in on Tuesday, following on the heels of the new restrictions in the North East, which came in at midnight this morning. No mixing with other houses and bars must close at 10. And it's your own fault. Why? Why have these new restrictions come in in the northeast? Why will they come in in Lancashire next week? Well, Larry knows. Enjoy yourself and kill a granny is the answer. That's right. That's right. Because you've been enjoying yourselves. You've been rushing home. And you've been spreading your dirty COVID germs around granny and granddad. It's a bit mad. We'll have a look at the new restrictions in the northeast and in the northwest and... West Yorkshire in a few minutes in a humorous way, or not, I don't know. But here's a bit of cause for cheer for you, a little bit of cause for cheer, Pete Jesus. Van the Man Morrison, remember him? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Van, one of Ireland's greatest exports, has joined celebrities like Noel Gallagher, Gallagher, Denise Welch, Ian Brown and others in condemning the lockdown and claiming that it isn't about keeping us safe, but rather it's about taking our liberty. The BBC this morning reported that Sir Van Morrison, second turncoat, has accused the government of taking our freedom in three new songs. Yes, so vexed is Van by the lockdown, he couldn't get his anger out in one song. Had to be three, good man. Three new songs which will drop. I'm down with the kids. That is the terminology. He will drop the songs. Eh? On September 25th. He uses words like scientists making up crooked facts, justifying enslaving the population. The new normal is not normal. He sings we were born to be free. Now apparently Van the Man recorded these songs recently in Belfast and in England. Good man! (laughs) I hope you didn't wear a mask on the plane either. And they're a bit bluesy and a bit jazzy, bit R&B apparently. There you are. No more lockdown has the lyrics. Are you ready? No more lockdown. No more government overreach. No more fascist bullies disturbing our peace. I like how he, lo- how, how, how he rhymes reach with peace. Good man. It goes on. No more taking of our freedom and our God-given rights. Pretending it's for our safety when it's really to enslave. Yeah. Freedom doesn't rhyme with enslave. But we love Van the Man. 25th of September. Download them. Been a bit of a backlash. Been a bit of a backlash. Northern Ireland's health minister has described the songs as dangerous. <laughs> dangerous. They represent a clear and present danger to the health and well-being of Northern Irish citizens. 
said nobody. I, I just made that up. What he actually said, Northern Ireland's Health Minister Robin Swan, he says if Van has scientific songs, he should present them. I don't know where Van Morrison gets his facts. I know where the emotions are on this, but I will say that sort of messaging is dangerous. What Van Morrison wouldn't give, what he wouldn't give to have his song banned, ah, and be relevant again. Van the Man! Welcome to Friday Afternoon's Richie Allen Radio Show. Ah, big gorra. Ah, be Jesus and me shamrocks. Uh, Van the Man Morrison on the Richie Allen radio show for Friday, September the 18th, 2020. What a tune that is. Bright side of the road. Van the Man loves the fact he's stepping up. I'm going to cliche my way right through the afternoon. I love that he's stepping up to the plate, cliche number one, and taking on the COVID bollocks. And before you go, bananas. Hi, Dana Banana, by the way. Nice to uh, see you on Twitter there. Before you lose your collective excrement, I've never said that there isn't a virus, a a, a thing going around, I'm pretty sure I had it, but it doesn't justify anything that we've seen since March. All right, let's say a few quick hellos. Dean Smith is driving home listening to the Richie Allen Radio Show. Thanks, Dean. Takes me back. Takes me back to my drive time days. Hi to Cosmic Chirp, how you doing, Cosmic? And to Mimi who says, uh, thanks for brightening my working day, Richie. Thank you, Mimi. That's uh, cheered me up no end. Thanks a lot. Hi to Charlie Stevenson, who says, it's blank verse, you heathen. It doesn't have to rhyme. Thanks, Charlie. I love you too. Hi to Gail. How you doing, Gail? Hi to Angela. Angelenya, I think it's pronounced. Hi to George. Hi to Billy Bob. How you doing, Billy Bob? Good lad. Scottish John is listening. How you doing, Scottish John? Stephen Gibb. If you drop me a tweet between now and the end of the programme, I'll be sure to say hello to you as long as I see it. As long as I see it. Right, let's swiftly move on. Before we hear from the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, I've been, I've had a bee in my bonnet today about pilot schemes in the UK's sporting stadia or stadiums. English Football League, not the top flight now, the top flight is the Premier League. The English Football League running pilot schemes this weekend, some clubs allowing 1,000 fans in. And what really cheeses me off about that, more than anything, is that a number of people have been in touch with me to say that their football clubs are in dire financial straits. And I know this to be true because I read the papers. A lot of football clubs are hemorrhaging money. They depend on match day revenue, not just the ticket sales, but obviously the merchandise sales, the burgers the hot dogs, the beers and the coffees, right, and the teas, they really depend on that money to pay their staff and to pay their players. Football clubs are in serious trouble. So rather than agree to participate in this pilot scheme, I wish that football clubs would tell the government to take a running jump. And if I was a fan, and I am a fan, Salford FC, but my my real, my first love was Manchester United. But I had a season ticket for Salford FC last season. I couldn't in good conscience go along as part of a thousand fans. I feel like it's almost like crossing a picket line, which might sound very melodramatic and a bit silly, but it's how I feel. I'd feel like a scab. And I would urge football clubs, particularly in League 1, League 2, don't comply with this crap. Open your gates, sell your tickets and let your fans back into the stadiums and preserve your businesses before they go under. And to fans, I say, don't participate. However desperate you might be this weekend to go to Kettering Town or Stockport County or Lincoln City, don't do it. Say no, we're not complying with this shit. Okay, either we all go back or nobody goes back at all. Now we saw this coming, didn't we? Story in the Mail Online today. Government could use emergency powers to give the public an unlicensed vaccine with midwives and soldiers among those trained up to administer it. Ministers would utilise regulations to bypass European Union law if a vaccine became available prior to the end of the Brexit transition agreement. Allegedly. 
we leave the European Union New Year's Eve. We don't really. That's the pretense. What they're saying is here, European Union laws might prevent the rollout of the vaccine, safety laws, but that the government can circumnavigate those laws in the interest of public health. And if a vaccine does become available, we can start sticking it in people's arses or in their arms. So the mail says the government is set to train members of the armed forces, health workers, midwives to administer this vaccine. Which, of course, as we know, and you will know if you've listened to the amazing Dr. Vernon Coleman, you will know they've indemnified, effectively, not just the, not just the pharmaceutical companies and the universities who are partnered in manufacturing this crap, but they've also indemnified themselves, the government. So they'll stick it in you. You might get a spinal infection, you might get narcolepsy, but hey, listen, you know, you, that's the risk. We had to take that risk, didn't we? For the greater good. They're going to start training people in the autumn so that an expanded workforce can assist with not only rolling out the new COVID vax, but also the annual flu jabs as well. Eh? Eh? 17 minutes past three, by the way. Toxic, here's a, here's a toxic tidal wave of shit for your, for your immune system. No, thank you. I'd rather not, thanks. Thanks for asking, though. I know where it's going, you know where it's going. Ah, fair enough, Paddy, but you're not going anywhere from now on in. I don't care. Got a lovely big house in Salford. <laughs> it's a three up, two down, <laughs> with a nice big garden. Former council house. Got a lovely house. I will entertain myself there, and I will spend my days wandering, traversing the country's beautiful national parks. You can stick your football and your live music and your shopping centres up your arse. So Downing Street has conceded, as you heard in the news, that the government is considering a second national lockdown. Here is Matt Hancock, the Health Secretary, speaking with the greatest reporter that ever lived, Kay Burley. And this was live on Sky News this morning. Now pay close attention. Matt Hancock, today on Sky News. Well, we'll do what is necessary to keep people safe Um, and the first line of defence is that everybody should follow uh, the social distancing we've talked about many many times hands face and space and uh, and keep that social distancing Uh, the contact tracing system which is working very well uh, that is the second line of defence after that these local lockdowns and the last line of defence is full national action and I don't want to see that but we will do whatever is necessary uh, to keep people safe in a very difficult pandemic. So that is something that you're considering, a national lockdown? Well, it isn't something that we ever take off the table, but it isn't something that we want to see either. It is the last line of defence. The last line of defence. He was on script today. Twitter is a great thing. If you look at the Twitter accounts of LBC of talk radio and BBC politics, you will hear Hancock repeat exactly the same words in the same order to those other programmes. Last line of defence, it's all scripted. These are, this is jingo, jingoistic language, really. They have every intention of imposing a second national lockdown. Now, what did Kay Burley do? Did she, on behalf of the small business associations on behalf of the Chambers of Commerce, on behalf of every man or woman who runs their own business for the mental and physical damages that the second lockdown will bring. Did Burley advocate for everybody else? Did she ask a question? No, she didn't. Did she say, Health Secretary, this will destroy lives. It will wreck the economy. The loss of unemployment, the loss of livelihood will devastate the nation. No, she didn't. Kay Burley preferred to just heckle Matt Hancock. It is what passes for journalism in 2020. If you don't believe me, listen yourself. My viewers are on the edge of their seat this morning listening to you, Health Secretary. Yeah, they're trying to look up your skirt, Kay. They're not listening for any journalism. Secretary, we know that 10 million people are going to be in a localised lockdown. My question to you is, what are you looking at? to decide whether there will be a second national lockdown next month and how close are we to that? 
Well, what we look at is first and foremost the number of cases. Um, secondly, the uh, the, the survey that's put out each week on a Friday lunchtime by the Office for National Statistics, that is the single best tool that we have uh, because that takes into account the fact that the number of tests has been, uh, has been rising, which obviously impacts on the number of positive results that you, uh, that you get through. Um, we also look at the number of people being hospitalised with COVID because that's when it gets very real. Given the criteria and all of the information that you have at your fingertips and you're looking at it ahead of later on today, how close are we this morning to a second lockdown next month? Burley's pantyhose is soaking wet. She is gagging for a second national lockdown. She's not asking the pertinent questions. She should be, she should be saying to him, my listeners want you to categorically rule out a second national lockdown because it will destroy them, Health Secretary. Give them some assurances this morning, please, is what Burley should be saying. But Burley, I'm not going to use a bad word now, is gagging for a second national lockdown. Next month. Well, what, She's gagging for it. What I would say to you and to your viewers is that the virus is... Uh, accelerating we've seen that number of it isn't number of hospitalizations increase uh, and double every eight days over the several last times, uh, health secretary you've said that self several times my question on behalf of my viewers this morning is how close are we to a second national lockdown given all the information that you have at your fingertips on a minute by minute basis this is just sensationalist tabloid garbage this masquerading as news it's grotesque in so many ways, isn't it? Gagging for it, Burley. And my answer to that question is that a national lockdown is the last line of defence and we want to use local action and we want people to follow the, the rule of six in order to avoid question. it. Question. Uh, how close are we, though? If they don't, how close are we to a national lockdown? Do you not know? Well, Kay, the, thi Kay, the thing is, um, I want to avoid a national... We understand that. Everybody does. So how close are we, though? What do we... Uh, uh, she is was, it, she if, was... If we carry on as we are, that we will be in a second national lockdown? What's the answer to my question? She was positively orgasmic. She was sexually aroused. The eventual answer from Hancock was, it's under review and we'll be keeping it under review. This afternoon we're hearing that they might be about to impose a two-week national lockdown be afraid be very afraid remember back in march when they said let's have a three-week lockdown remember that 24 minutes past three it's under review said hancock that's journalism in 2020 we'll hear from the oncologist carol sakura in a moment he's also worked for the world health organization he was on sky news also we'll hear from him presently um but before we do that we're going to have another tune because it's drive time, don't you know? Well, we know where we're going. That is Talking Heads, David Byrne, Tina Weymouth, of course, and the rest. And a road to nowhere on the Richie Allen Radio Show, special Friday afternoon edition, because I was away on Wednesday. Ruth Romano, how you doing, Ruth? Richie, I'm breaking, as I'm sure many others are. I can't cope with this shit anymore. I want out, stop the world, I want to get off, says Ruth. Ruth, in the immortal words of Vernon Coleman, you are not alone. And I'll paraphrase what the, the great man says at the conclusion of his excellent videos, which are available these days at brandnewtube.com. Not only are you not alone, but millions of people a day around the world are waking up to this reality. And the way you're feeling today is the way I was feeling last week. So don't sweat it. There's nothing wrong with it. You're obviously a, um, a, a real human being. Y your reaction is the sane reaction to an insane situation. There's nothing wrong with it. Get a bit of fresh air. Don't watch the news as much as you can. I I've said this to some of my close friends. Try and avoid watching the daily news. And I guarantee you, just switching it off, spending a bit of time outdoors, off screen, get away from your smartphone or your tablet, it will do you the power of good. Don't take my word for it. 
Again, the aforementioned, an old man in a chair will tell you that himself. Thanks for all your tweets. Lots of them coming in. I'm going to be reading them as I promised as we go along. Hi to Karen. How you doing, Karen? Let me scroll up. Let me scroll up. Alfie is list- listening to this from a building site in Worcestershire. How you doing, Alfie? Good man. How you doing, John? Enjoying the program. Thanks, John. Uh, Unity and Light is in the northwest too. And Hass says we have to rise against these bastards, not let them win. I'm ignoring every rule. They are a bunch of clowns. You're not on your own. And that's a message to Ruth. You are not on your own. Laurie is a friend of the programme's long-time listener and is a fan of the Kentucky Wildcats. So she's in the US, of course. How you doing, Laurie? On being a scab or crossing a picket line, if you go along with a thousand people for a pilot scheme to watch your local sports team, Laurie says, I agree with it, Richie, with you. With this nonsense, I wouldn't even accept courtside seats at Rupp Arena to see my Kentucky Wildcats. Thank you very much, Laurie. Claire Conway is listening to the show in sunny Devonshire on the last day of her holidays. How you doing, Claire? Lovely to hear from you. How you doing, Jeffrey? How you doing, Charlotte and Burnley? My pal, how you doing? Hi to Nikki. How you doing, Nikki? Nikki says, Richie, connected with that, I spent all of last Friday in the afternoon trying to find a document that I'd read last year saying that vaccines are deliberately not classified as medicines because there are fewer legal grounds for suing for damages with non-medicines. Needless to say, that document has been wiped. That's Nick. Nick Bickle. Hey, dear Nick, thank you for that. Hi to Sarita as well. Hi to Colm in Dublin. Cheers, there's a lot of you got the message that I was on at three o'clock this afternoon. Anyway, right, uh, we'll do this very quickly and then we'll get straight back to Professor Carol Sikora who's got a couple of interesting things to say about the new measures, the new lockdown restrictions in the North East, in Lancashire and West Yorkshire after this. Renowned healer Mark Bayerski travels the world to find the most unique and powerful crystals for self-healing. Since the ancient times, crystals have been used as healing tools. They hold a natural healing vibration and are highly charged in positive energy. Mark teaches how to channel the universal energy and transfer it to the crystal to activate its healing power. Each crystal is used for its unique ability to target a different physical or emotional challenge. Mark Bayerski is an author, healer, speaker, and founder of the Pure Energy Healing Academy. He shares powerful messages of inspiration and healing on his daily YouTube videos, reaching millions worldwide. Mark's crystals, healing oils, and incense sticks are most sought after by other healers. His collection is available online at www.markbayerski.com. His work is presented through Lemon House, a company that creates and curates consciously made gifts. This is The Richie Allen Show, the most listened to independent news radio show in Europe. And it's uh, 27 minutes to 4 o'clock. You might be grabbing this on YouTube later on, or iTunes, or Spotify, Podomatic, whatever. How you doing? Let's hear from Professor Carol Sikora then. A lot of people like this guy. I don't know what to make of him. I don't dislike him. I've never met him. But he was on Sky this afternoon at lunchtime to talk about new rules. For the North East, which we've heard about, and the North West and West Yorkshire. So how does he feel about it, these new lockdown measures, which came into effect at midnight this morning, yeah, in Newcastle in the North East, and will come into effect on Tuesday in Lancashire and West Yorkshire. What does he think of these things? Here's Carol Sikora speaking to Sky News this afternoon. Well, a bit shocked by it all. I think we all are. We thought we were coming to the end of it. I think the problem is that the the infection rate is going up, and that's not uh, too bad. What is bad is that the hospital admissions are also beginning to go up. So just as a scale of things, on Tuesday, there were 154 people admitted to hospital. The previous week, there were 84 people. So that's a significant difference, and the rolling average has gone up. It's much flatter than before, which is good news and uh, flatter in the sense it's not exponentially going up. 
Uh, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. And, you know, you can make a shopping list of what you can do to try and reduce the infection. And it includes everything you can imagine from total lockdown through to curfews, through to a partial lockdown, localized lockdown and so on. Uh, but it is a list. And the, the nuclear option, if you like, is what Boris is now considering, uh, is a total lockdown. And there will be people on his scientific advisory committee that will be recommending that. Very important. There will be people on his scientific advisory committee, SAGE, who will be recommending that. Of course, SAGE will be unilateral. I would imagine, I can't prove that, but they will be pretty much, uh, they will be agreed, I suppose, there will be uniformity, unilateral, as I said. They will say, yeah, absolutely, lock down the country again. Just keep the schools open. Let people go to work if they have to, but close everything else. Imagine the devastation. What else does he say, Carol Sakura? And we'll just have to see what happens to those hospital admissions over the next few days. And what would be your preference then, the nuclear option, or do you think that this circuit break idea where we could see a two-week lockdown being imposed on our social life, basically, but schools and workplaces being the only uh, sort of essential travel that would be permitted, do you think that would be a sensible compromise? Before he answers... She said circuit break. You heard circuit break in the news at the top of the hour. If you go onto the BBC website now, you'll see circuit break. These are not buzzwords that were pulled out of the air by people like Matt Hancock and Boris Johnson. These are carefully crafted phrases. The phraseology is very important to these people, these words, you know, in in terms of how they go about programming people to accept these absolutely insane ideas. People are not sick in this country. They are lying when they are telling you that hospital admissions are doubling on a day-by-day basis. They are not. Well, I can speak for one hospital, and that is Salford Royal. They're not seeing a huge increase in admissions. In fact, they're not seeing any increase in admissions at all because of any rise in cases. The cases they are finding are in asymptomatic younger people. They are lying when they say, we've seen a huge growth in cases, so we will inevitably see hospitalizations. That's a lie because the cases, as I said, are being found in younger people whom are asymptomatic. So what does Carol Sikora think then, this World Health Organization guy of yore, not anymore, uh, who now works as an oncologist? Does he prefer the circuit breaker methodology where you shut down various parts of the economy here and there, impose curfews, or the nuclear option, what does he think? That would be a reasonable compromise. I think top of the pile are keeping work going, keeping educational programs, schools, university, keeping that all going. Uh, the real problem, of course, is that all of these have a cost, uh, an economic cost, if we don't do it. The hospitality industry is on its knees anyway now. The hospitality industry is on its knees, he says. Well, dear listener, he doesn't know the half of it. This lunchtime, BBC's Jeremy Vine had Ollie Volkhard on. I hope I pronounced that right. Volkhard, yes. Ollie Volkhard is a man behind the Volkhard Group in the North East. They've got 15 venues. Entertainment, restaurants, pubs, the whole lot, right? He's got hundreds of employees. The news that there would be a curfew imposed in the North East from 10pm has devastated Ollie Volkhard. He's positively sick. Listen carefully to what he says. Yeah, I mean, very much so. 17 days ago, um, the government was paying people to come into our venues. And now we are, because of local authority requests, being asked to, to in, in effect, close again. And to try and run a business, to try and employ people, to try and have any level of planning with such rapid changes seems seems almost impossible. Mm. But but 10 o'clock curfew, you can still run a bar or a restaurant closing at 10 o'clock. I guess you start your first first orders at five or something. Well, I mean, the nighttime economy is, is a word people use, but actually the, the hospitality economy runs from nine o'clock in the morning, it's eight o'clock in the morning, all the way through it. It doesn't have to involve alcohol. The challenge we have is we are being told on one, on one side that households shouldn't mix with other households, and then it's advisory that they don't do that in public places. Therefore, the only people that could come to a venue in theory are people who live together. Now, that is, that is either a student house of lots of people or husband and wives 
for people with children. It's a very, very limited market and certainly not, not viable in, in any of my company. It isn't viable, he says. Would you believe on the same call was a woman called Nina Mishkoff? She was on the... I've no idea why. She used to be Simon Cowell back in the 1980s. What she was doing there, I have no idea. I listened to the programme. Here's Nina Mishkoff's response to what Ollie Volkard just said. Well, the thing is, you know, the government is, is, has got has this kind of juggling act going on because they're trying to keep um, the businesses open, but people are not social distancing. And that's, that's the problem. You know... You, 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 you know, Ollie was talking about, you know, the government encouraging people to go out. The government encouraged people to go out, but they didn't encourage them to get close to each other. I mean, we seem to forget that the whole point of what social, we use the term social distancing. What it means is that we need to avoid getting close enough to other people so that they can spread, you know, infected droplets to us. So that is the, that is, People seem to forget. How low has the BBC sunk when it is fucking inviting Nina Mishkoff, a celebrity from the time when Betty Davis films were showing at your local fucking cinema? Nina Mishkoff is on complaining about young people getting too close to one another and spreading their droplets. This is vaudeville, isn't it? BBC Two, lunchtime. You can't believe your ears, right? And to forget that. Well, and that, if, if that is, hang on, if that's the guiding thought, you can't really run a nightclub or a bar at all, can you? Because once you put alcohol into a room that's halfway crowded, you've got a problem. I agree. I absolutely agree. So that, that they're trying this measure of, of a cut-off point at 10 o'clock at night um, just, to, just to say, well, let, let's try and get people so they're not so drunk that they're falling all over each other. And then going home and killing Granny. And ultimately, I suppose we'd all, if we believe Nina Mishkoff and Jeremy Vine, and Nikki Campbell, and Rachel Borden, and all the rest of them, if, we, if, if young people just followed a very simple golden rule. Don't kill Granny. We'd all be out of it. Back to normal. It's young people's fault. What was Ollie Volcard's response to this? He's the guy with the 15 venues in the North East. What was his response to that garbage? from Nina Mishkoff. Well, here it is. I think this is a, a really lazy argument. You know, a lazy argument. Nightclubs aren't open anyway. Nightclubs can't open and haven't been open since the beginning of this. If you look at the hospitality business, restaurants are closed. I'm standing here in a moment in a bistro in the middle of Newcastle which has alcohol and food sales. We've taken over half our seats out. We've run COVID secure the whole time. We've, have, we've followed every rule that we've been asked to follow from the beginning of, of being allowed to reopen. We've followed every single rule. And now we've imposed another rule because maybe some people are breaking the rules, but maybe we should be specifically targeting rule breakers rather than people. I'm, I've been in business 25 years. I employ 300 people. I'm a, I'm a good member of society. And yet I am, I am in dire Dire straight to the business. Yeah, I understand. I understand. I understand, says Vine. You don't understand, Vine. You don't. You get paid a six figure salary from the BBC to talk bollocks for a living, to play records and talk bollocks and preserve the status quo. So you have no idea how he feels. You could hear the angst, the anguish in the guy's voice. This is tyranny, this. And you got fucking Jeremy Vine and Nina Mishkoff sitting there arguing with them. I mean, what's going on? I, I, I have every sympathy. I can completely understand that. And it's not your fault. It's the people who are irresponsible. It's the, on the, on the whole, it's the younger generation. It's not oldies like me who are going out raving. Uh, so, you know, it is these people who are spoiling it for absolutely everybody. And yeah. this, is, this, is, this is the problem. This is the problem. People are spoiling it for everybody. Young people are going out being young people going out to bars, having a few drinks, having a crack, which is what young people have done ever since Moses was in short trousers. But now there's a massive mind control operation going on. The likes of which we never, many of us never saw coming so soon. It's all pervasive, it's everywhere. To invert everything that you ever knew, every natural law, every... Everything we understood to be real and to be logical is being turned upside down on its head. Young people are being told that they must give up their lives, sacrifice their lives now and their future lives, because if they don't, they might give some germs to some vulnerable person who might keel over 
and die. It's truly extraordinary. And it's 16 minutes to the top of the hour. This is the Richie Allen Radio Show. And I am broadcasting live from Salford. It's a lovely warm afternoon, a very warm autumnal uh, afternoon here in the northwest of the country. What are we doing next? I don't operate, I don't work from scripts, me. What are we doing? All right, yeah. Speaking of the economic devastation, one publican in Newcastle was so distraught at the devastation he's facing, actually phoned a government helpline. What the government helpline told him is a disgrace. Here's Sky News' Gerard Tubb with the story. Again, feast your ears. The impact, though, on businesses, and we've been hearing from some of those today, is significant. I was listening to one uh, pub owner saying that uh, he uh, is, is facing big problems now because uh, his nighttime trade is disappearing. The nighttime economy in Newcastle is estimated to be worth about £340 million a year just in this one city, employing 6,500 people. And it's pretty much gone. A lot of the nighttime economy here starts at 10 o'clock, but everyone has to go home then. He was saying uh, he contacted the government helpline and the best advice was get a loan. He said, what is the point of getting a loan? I'm struggling now. I don't want more debt to have to pay back. Oh my God! So the government, based on junk science, tells publicans in Newcastle they have to fuck themselves in the arse and ruin their businesses. Distraught, probably tearful, probably stressed to the point where his heart might be in danger of failing, a poor bastard rings up a government helpline and the government helpline says to him, why don't you get a loan? What kind of fuckery are you? Why don't you get a loan? And I've been speaking to you as a real journalist, and I'm very proud of that. And I sometimes get criticised for saying that. Because y- you imagine sometimes that I'm tr- trying to, to, to put somebody specifically, to, to be, that I'm being specific in referring to somebody else, maybe in the independent media. I'm not. Never. I'm not. I'm a real journalist. I've never blotted my copybook. I can look myself in the mirror every morning and every evening before I go to bed. Kay Burley, we heard earlier on, failing utterly in her duty to the public, to the people of this country, to hold the health minister to account on her programme. Gagging for lockdown Burley. Do you know what Kay Burley tweeted out? Somebody who claims to be a fucking journalist. Do you know what she tweeted out five hours ago today after speaking to Matt Hancock? She tweeted out, whatever you think of him, or this government, we surely must accept that Matt Hancock is doing everything he can to save lives. Hashtag COVID-19. The woman whose responsibility I would give my right fucking arm to get five minutes with Matt Hancock. And this ginger bastard not only won't ask him a legitimate question, but then gives him a fucking pass on Twitter and says, whatever you think of him, we have to accept that he's doing everything he can to save lives. And of course, Hancock responded to the tweet. Oh, thanks, Kay. I'm doing my best as Hancock. We're fucked. The UK has fallen, hasn't it? My feet wouldn't have hit the ground if I'd have tweeted out my support for a politician in my days in commercial and national media. Can you imagine it? Tweeting my fucking support after failing five minutes earlier to challenge the guy on a single fucking point for failing to represent the builders, the hospitality workers, the engineers, the publicans, the factory workers, the office workers, for failing to do our job and say to him, what the fuck are you doing? You're killing people, man. Open the fucking thing up. Why don't you do that? No, she won't do that. No, that bastard will go on Twitter and say, oh, he's doing everything he can. Oh, God, love him. Holy God, huh? Jesus. Jesus wept. 
My God. Right hand Fred on the Richie Allen radio show. Yeah. I hate name droppers as a rule, but Richard Fairbrass, a very good friend of the programs, I'm in touch with him uh, from time to time. I was in touch with him last week, and I know he'll be listening to this at some stage. So, Richard, love you, mate. Thanks for uh, the kind words and the support. Uh, Richard was on the program. Uh, uh, Fred was on the program. Jesus Christ, Richie. <laughs> Fred was on the program. Excuse my uh, French there, my bad language. Uh, Fred was on the programme about three years ago and I'd like to get him back on again. Speaking of good friends, my mate Peter sent me a book today. Peter, if you're listening, thank you, my friend. My phone is refusing to take a charge, so I couldn't send you a text to thank you. Um, I'm struggling with my mobile phone, which is not good in this business. It's refusing to take a charge and I don't have a spare charger. So I'll have to get on line like the speed of light to get one. But thanks, Peter. I got the book, mate. Thanks for the lovely note as well. That's concerning a future show, which will be very, very, very interesting. Hayden Hewitt, that big, bold, blue-ticked bugger on YouTube. Great guy. Great friend. Privileged friend. I'm privileged. Lovely bloke. He's aghast. He's also aghast that we have national television news presenters tweeting their support for a bloke that they previously failed utterly to challenge in vaudevillian magnificence. Aghast is Hayden. These are some times, aren't they? Hi to Kimmy. How you doing, Kimmy? Nice to know you're listening this afternoon. We have a healthy, healthy, healthy audience this afternoon, despite the late, the very late notice about it. Hi to Peter Dooley. I hope you're nothing to Stacey Dooley. Peace. Stacey Dooley. Stacey Dooley. Stacey Dooley is doing a podcast for BBC Radio 5 Live, looking back at her career and looking back at interviews that she conducted through her career. I don't know what's going on. I, I keep expecting somebody to wake me up and hand me a cup of cocoa. Here's a cup of cocoa, son. None of this is happening. You, you, you just dreamt it all. I expect to be woken up with a cup of cocoa and to be told, if you don't get up, you're going to be late for the match. This is fucking crazy, this, isn't it? What's going on? Speaking of getting up late, William Henderson thought the programme was at four o'clock. You're daft. I'm not going to finish that sentence. Three o'clock, William. You haven't missed much, mate. It's garbage today. Absolute garbage. Garbage is what it is. Hi to Mohanad. And I'm I'm melting in studio because it's very warm in studio. I didn't think it would be, but it's very warm in studio. Let me give a couple of plugs. Hayden Hewitt, Trigger Warning. Dot TV. So YouTube.com forward slash Trigger Warning TV. In fact, if I just uh, click on Hayden's big baldy image there. Uh, do check out uh, altfeed.org. It's a very interesting new idea. Uh, altfeed.org. Check that out as well. And he's the co-founder of LiveLeak.com. Dr. Vernon Coleman. Several times a week. Uh, an old man in a chair. New episodes will be posted on brandnewtube.com. Check them out. It's exceptional stuff. It's exceptional. And it's very good. It's very useful. When you have a neighbour or a brother or a sister who's kind of getting interested because they're kind of losing their, well, mind because of what's happening. Because they're slowly but surely waking up to what's going on. Uh, Vernon Coleman can't beat it. Get a, an old man in a chair, brand new, tube.com. Four minutes to four o'clock. I think I'll be with you till about 4.30 or thereabouts. Having a clue. Having a Scooby-Doo. Right, uh, we heard from Gerard Tubbs, so we did. We heard Deeply Dippy from Right Said Fred, which is a magnificent song. Sadiq Khan is the Mayor of London. He was on LBC with James O'Brien. Yeah. He's just cancelled New Year's Eve as the Mayor of London. Well, he's cancelled it for Londoners anyway. What are you thinking at the moment? 
bringing all of these factors into consideration and contemplation about about New Year's Eve. Is there going to be a firework display? What, what, what are no, the plans? What no. are we looking at? So, so I, I can tell you, James, there will not be uh, fireworks on New Year's Eve at this year, like in previous years. We simply can't afford to have the numbers of people who congregate on New Year's Eve congregating. Uh, what we're working on, uh, we're not in a, in a position yet to uh, say what it is because we've not done the details yet. Is what we're working on is to do something that people can enjoy in the comfort and safety of their living rooms on TV and so as soon as we've managed to bottom that out I'll be letting uh, uh, Londoners uh, know people across the country in fact but we can't lose that s slot James I'll tell you why because New Year's Eve is a really good opportunity for the rest of the world to see how wonderful our city is and it, you know w particularly during a recession we need to continue investment in our city and people coming to London and so no fireworks on New Year's Eve uh, it's kind of hard to observe the rule of six how are you going to I mean if it's still in place how on earth would you keep people out of town well there'll be nothing happening in town and so the key thing is to avoid there being a There'd be nothing happening in town on New Year's Eve, says Sadiq Khan. There'd been a, a reason Some for people to come into uh, in down, yeah, Square well, or on uh, which did Street. happen in previous years. You remember, yes. we're old enough to remember life before. Bars fireworks. will be open at the moment, won't they? I well, mean, people well, will be coming in for a drink, if not for a, for a firework display. We'll have to wait and see how the virus pans out. I mean, it's still a number of weeks away. We're in September, um, you know. But it, as it stands, no weeks. official celebration whatsoever in the capital. I can confirm there will be no fireworks this year. You've cancelled New Year's Eve, Sadiq Khan. I've cancelled the fireworks in the heart of London this year. Um, don't give my opponents an opportunity to write that headline, James, please. Yeah. He's cancelled fireworks for London for New Year's Eve. Months away. Two minutes to the top of the hour. Do you want to hear the headlines if you've just joined me? No, you don't? Uh, sure, we'll have a listen to them anyway. Uh, tighter restrictions will come into force in Lancashire, Merseyside, parts of the Midlands and West Yorkshire. These restrictions will come in next Tuesday. Banning separate households from meeting each other at home or in private gardens. And pubs and restaurants must shut early in parts of Lancashire and in Merseyside as well. Yeah. Virus growth is widespread across the country, says the government. And Nicola Sturgeon says this weekend is critical in the fight to stem COVID. Those are your COVID headlines. Uh, at least from official sources anyway. Oh, yes. This is the Richie Allen Radio Show. It's an impromptu, it's an unusual show Friday afternoon because I was away on Wednesday. I should be with you for another 30 minutes or thereabouts. Speaking of Nicola Sturgeon, we'll hear from Nicola in a moment. Not before we hear another tune, though. Speaking of Hayden Hewitt, this is for him. <laughs> Ozzy Osbourne and Crazy Train on the Richie Allen Radio Show. Great tune, that. That's for Adana Banana as well as Hayden Hewitt. She likes that. Lovely. I I'm enjoying the interaction today, by the way. It's nice to do this. It's been so long since I did drive time. I used to love drive time. And then I got bored of it because obviously it wasn't news and politics analysis and interviews which drove me mad. But I always enjoyed drive time. So long as the playlist was up to the task. You know what I mean? Crush Love on Twitter is optimistic about vaccine uptake in terms of optimistic that it will be small. Crush Love says, he or she, when it gets released, the vaccine, the uptake will be very small. People are playing the COVID game at the moment because of the furlough scheme and, and all the rest of it. But when it comes to being injected, the same people will say, no, thank you. I hope you're right, Crush Love. I don't share your optimism, but that doesn't mean anything. I'm a curmudgeonly prick, is what I am, at the best of times. Just ask anybody who knows me. Hi to Annie72, how you doing, Annie72? Hi to Charlotte, who says the second lockdown, whether local or national, is going to give curtain twitching snitches more reason to up the ante, as they blame anyone they see disobeying as the reason we are in this position, says Charlotte. Thank you, Charlotte. Indeed. My pal based ninja in Liverpool. They're crowing today, Liverpudlians. They signed a footballer or a fuzzballer from Deutschland called Thiago Alcantara. And they're positively cock a hoop about it. Liverpudlians. The champions, it makes me sick to say it. Base ninja says, I'd forget Christmas people. That's the spirit, son. That's more like me. At least the kids won't be too upset if you tell them that Rudolph tested positive. 
Plus, who is going to be able to afford to celebrate? <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, there's a frog in my tr- throat. I can't read the rest of the comment now. He says, who can afford to celebrate? Those who work in finance, arms, telecom, big oil and pharma. Everyone else, go and get fucked, he says. IT Bird says, cancelling New Year's in London just shows how much destroying anything joyful and light in our lives is part of this sinister agenda. Jesus wept. We better hear from Jimmy Cranky so I can grab some water. See what happens when I do <clears throat> more than I should do. Jimmy Cranky was indulging in a feast of fish whiffery on television at lunchtime this afternoon. Jimmy Cranky. <laughs> Now, Jimmy has a plan and she needs the public's help. This is, well, this is dystopian. Listen to what Jimmy Cranky wants people to do in Scotland. Listen carefully. Now, there's another issue I want to update you on and it's another uh, area where uh, some of us may be able to help in the fight against this virus and it involves Scotland's involvement in the UK-wide COVID infection survey. This survey is designed to track the spread and the prevalence of the virus in the general population. It's conducted by the Office for National Statistics and the University of Oxford. And following a successful pilot in England, it has now been expanded to other parts of the UK. In Scotland, it will ultimately see up to 15,000 people being tested every fortnight. Households will be randomly selected for the survey and over the coming period, these households will all be sent a letter inviting them to participate. Those letters will provide details on how to register. Uh, The first of them should be arriving today and from Monday, survey teams will begin visiting households that agree to take part. Uh, Those who do take part will be asked to administer swabs to their throats and noses to test for the virus. People aged 12 years or older can take the swab themselves, but parents and carers should administer them for younger children. A subset of participants over the age of 16 will also be invited to provide blood samples to test whether they already have had COVID. Participants will be asked to take further tests every week for the first five weeks, then every month for up to a year. Up to a year? Up to a year. Up to a year? And members of the survey team will visit households to collect the tests. Members of the survey team will visit homes to collect the tests, eh? These results will help us to see how many people are infected with the virus at a given point of time, whether or not they have symptoms. And they will give us a sense of how many people are ever likely to have had the infection. And they should therefore provide us with really important new insights into the spread of COVID in Scotland. The survey will also provide additional data on the characteristics of those who are testing positive and so it will help... The characteristics of those testing positive is what we want. ...help us to examine any difference in the impact of the virus on different groups in society. Nicola? What kind of fuckery is this? Right, so if you accept that these gangsters, if you accept that these gangsters know the truth, that the virus which let's say it exists, I I think it does or did, is nothing more than a bad flu, which is the truth. That's irrefutable now. That isn't my opinion. That isn't conjecture. So horrible little trolls like Nicola Sturgeon, they know that the virus is nothing of any real concern except to those who are badly ill or comorbidities or in bad shape or suffering with chronic illnesses anyway it's not a problem for anybody else so they know this so why are they asking people on such a massive scale to supply them their dna do you know what i'll do i'll i'll leave that one hanging in the air and you can send me your theories on twitter they know that the virus is nothing to be too concerned about they know this They're lying through their teeth on national television every five minutes. But they know. Why do they want people to provide them with samples? 15,000, hundreds of thousands in the UK, maybe millions. They want these saliva samples every week or every day. Boris Johnson says every day. Why do they really want all of that information about us? All of that encoded 
DNA information. Any theories as to why they're doing this? I have one, but if I say it, I'll just be shot down as a crazy conspiracy theorist. It's ten and a half minutes past the air. What do you think? Keep the old tweets coming into me there. Is that Richie Allen Show on Twitter? I say again, if you live in Scotland and you listen to this programme, tell as many people as you possibly can. Do not participate in that harebrained, sinister scheme as just described to you by Jimmy Cranky herself. Don't participate. They know the virus is nothing. So why do they really want all of that data? Your DNA. Why do they want it? You tell me. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Is that Richie Allen Show? Hi to Simone Walsh. How you doing, Simone? Lovely to hear from you today. I have a frog in my throat, in my throat. Right, it's time for another tune. It is, of course, a drive time, isn't it? So let's have Blondie. This is Atomic on the Richie Allen Radio Show, Friday afternoon. Ah, it's uh, the 18th of September. It's the time, 12 minutes past the hour. Blondie, Atomic on the Richie Allen Radio Show. Oh, yeah. Good tune, that. Love that. Uh, lots of answers. William says it's the modern day fingerprint system, basically what you said, data collection. Data collection, which will be about our control. Mimi says the same. Lepadinus, whatever the effect that is, in terms of a name that is. Just like Monsanto have monopolized the seeds industry, hence why the dehumanization of natural people has commenced. Yes, number of you saying DNA collection. And if you believe in a depopulation agenda, which I do, why do I believe it? Because I've seen the documents. You can't hide it. Spiro Skouras, hell of a guy, was on the radio programme with me last night. Check him out on youtube.com, Spiro Skouras. How you doing, pal? Working the night shift this week, top man. Why do you suppose the eugenicists are pushing transhumanism? Why do you suppose the eugenicists pushing transhumanism want your DNA? Two and two equals, says Spira. Why do you suppose the eugenicists, the eugenicists pushing transhumanism want your DNA exactly? It's to build the framework for the rollout of that very agenda. Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. Patrizia says, Patrizia says, perhaps the collecting the DNA is so that they can then tailor future escaped viruses to be more lethal and then tailor vaccines to suit each type of DNA. For the very same reason, it's the culling fields, she says. That's a very good point. I have uh, a lot of uh, sympathy with that point of view. Thanks for those comments. Very quickly, let's move on. Uh, 17 minutes past the hour, or 17 minutes past four, this Friday afternoon. Let's move on very quickly. Very quickly. You will remember yesterday afternoon. Can I do this? Let me do this. Forgot to get his uh, full title. I could dig out yesterday's bullet points, but you know, uh, probably can't. Probably can't. What am I doing here? Ah, oh, Jesus. I want to play you some audio from yesterday's program, but I don't want to balls it up by giving you incorrect information about the character involved. So let me just uh, bring it up. Uh, yes, okay, here we go. Yesterday afternoon, yesterday morning even, on BBC Radio 5 Live breakfast programme, we heard from a man called Tim Spector, who's a professor of genetic epidemiology at King's College in London, and he heads up their twin research programme. So he's somebody that the mainstream media has liked. They like him. They brought him on BBC Radio 5 Live breakfast yesterday, and he said some things that they didn't like. He said the children really don't get coronavirus. He said there's really no point in testing children. There's no point in sending children home from school because they have a runny nose or maybe a little bit of a cough. This is what he said. We need to hear him because Radio 5 Live attempted to do some damage control. Believe it or not. Today, so let's hear... Tim Spector yesterday speaking with Nikki Campbell about children and COVID. A lot of the um, 
anxiety is, is also caused by what's happening in children and schools. Um, I just wanted to, if I had a moment, just to highlight that, um, the difference between COVID and a cold. Um, our, our app is showing that um, basically if, if uh, you know, a parent or a child has cold-like symptoms, a runny nose, uh, congestion, sneezing, then highly unlikely to have COVID. And we're, th this is, you know, based on, you know, lots of people's data. I've heard him being interviewed before and he doesn't speak like that. He's not a very hesitant speaker, as he sounds here. He's usually very fluent and fluid. Here he's expecting himself to be stopped in his tracks, to be dumped out of the programme. And he's measuring his words carefully. He's basically saying, don't be testing children. Um, it really it doesn't cause those wet symptoms. And, what it, and if you don't have really severe headache or fatigue in the first week, then uh, you know, you're highly unlikely to have COVID as well because the fatigue and headache run across all the uh, age groups. Um, they're non-specific, but they're, you know, when you've had it, you know it. And... 80% of everyone has that. So, again, for parents worried about their children, you know, even if they've got some other symptoms like a cough, it's probably not uh, related to COVID. And most of the tests being done, you know, 98% are still negative at the moment. So people are still over calling uh, COVID at home. So I think that would be the sensible advice, particularly until the testing system gets back on its feet again. Tim, Tim. Very good. Rachel Borden can't wait to jump in. She's Nikki Campbell's co-host. This was yesterday morning. You heard them clicking their keyboards there. They were probably corresponding with their producer, whom was probably telling them by typing them a message to interrupt the challenge, to try and basically stop Tim Spector from saying what he's saying, which is hugely important. Stop fucking around with children. Leave them alone. Don't send them home. Don't send them for a test. They won't have COVID. Can't have that. Back on its feet again. Tim, Tim, this is, this is a really important point because lots of parents are being uh, told their children are sent home from school. They've got a bit of a cough um, or even a cold in some cases. One parent said to me the other day, if you give your child cowpole, they could be um, susceptible or they could... Yeah, she's throwing a smoke grenade into the room here. I didn't get into this in great depth yesterday. I got into it a little bit, but not in great depth. She's basically coming on to fart about saying nothing, but then saying parents are confused. But he was just explaining that they didn't need to be confused. She's now confusing them. The epidemiologist, the expert has said, there's no need to give children the test. There's no need to worry when they sneeze or have a runny nose or a little bit of a cough. There's no need. But she has to muddy that, you see. This is why these bastards should be fucking tarred and feathered in the end. Horr, Campbell, Burley, Piers Morgan. Ultimately, they're, they're your enemy, these people. They are your enemy. They are willfully preventing or trying to prevent you from hearing the truth. That's what she's doing here. Bring the virus. And, and schools are telling them to go out and get tested. It's part of the reason that the whole testing system is under such strain. So can you clarify exactly when a child... Why did you fucking interrupt him, you daft bint? He, he just told you. Actually doesn't work here because it gives him the opportunity to repeat what he's already said. A child should be tested. Well, at the moment... Um, I don't think it, it's sensible to test a child unless they're severely ill Amen. and they have sort of all the symptoms uh, because just a, a child having a cough is actually, that's a rare sign of COVID. It's not like adults. Adults, you know, we do know that the loss of smell and, and the cough and the fever are the cardinal signs. In children, uh, having a cough, if you don't have a, a real severe headache and severe fatigue, really is not likely to be COVID. So, um, anyone with, you know, cold-like symptoms or runny nose, it really doesn't matter what else they've got, yeah. highly unlikely to be cold. Oh, yeah. And so we have to rethink this, particularly in children. And, and people have got to be sensible and realise that colds are, you know, perhaps 100, 100 times more likely to be a cold than, than COVID. OK, thank you very much indeed, uh, Tim. There's Tim Spector. It's 7.15. Yeah.
And as I mentioned yesterday, when they introduced him nine minutes earlier, they couldn't, they were falling over him in admiration before they knew what he was going to say. Kissing his arse, basically. That useless bastard, Nicky Campbell. Smarmy Campbell licking his arse, his tongue so far up his arse it was coming out Tim's mouth. When he introduced them, he said, uh, oh, you know, the great professor of genetic epidemiology, twin research. But at the end, let's try and muddy the waters again at the very end, because he said what we didn't want to hear. He's just Tim now. He's just plain old Tim. That's unprecedented in, in, in the media. It's unprecedented. You exit the interview, uh, the interview as the presenter by reminding the audience who you've just been listening to. This is fucking sick, this. I run around Media City. I've had to have a talk with myself. If I ever bumped into any of these people. To go the other way and put my hands in my pocket. Which is what I will do. Because I don't believe in violence. I don't like it and I don't advocate it. But I'd have to struggle to walk away from people like that. They are willfully, knowingly, consciously doing everything they fucking can to prevent you from hearing people like him, from, from people like Carl Hennigan, from people like Vernon Coleman. And what do you do with these people in the end? Well, if we ever come out the other side of it, if we ever do, we exile the bastards. You send them to a fucking island and leave them there. It's dreadful stuff. Why am I repeating that? Because today, Friday the 18th of September, well, the BBC Radio 5 Live Breakfast, the exact same programme, well, they went in for a little bit of damage control. They brought on a paediatrician and they claimed again that there was some confusion. We needed cleared up about children and testing. So they found a paediatrician called Louisa Pollock. Louisa Pollock came on to talk bollocks. Here she is on Radio 5 Live today to repair the damage done by Tim Spector. Yeah. So I think part of the reason why there's confusion is there's really two different questions that are getting mixed up. And one of them is what are the symptoms of coronavirus that children might have? And the other is when should my child get a test? So we uh, undertook one of the largest studies of children with confirmed coronavirus UK in, in the UK. And we found that the commonest symptoms were fever in 70%, cough in 35% and nausea or vomiting in 32%. But we also found that children had a wide range of other symptoms. So they This had, is bullshit now. So they had sore throat, runny nose, fatigue, headache, basically all the same symptoms that we see in other childhood viruses. About 20 children in the country. Right, that is a gross exaggeration, forgive me. That's a gross exaggeration, so forgive me. Children haven't really had COVID-19. And those of them where the virus, if it exists, I think it does exist, those of them who did have it, obviously were asymptomatic, they had no idea whatsoever. So only a tiny, tiny fraction, you're talking hundreds, not thousands, hundreds you're talking, of children actually presented symptoms with COVID. And she's trying to say now that they had diarrhoea and runny noses and coughs. And basically, if your child fucking farts, it might be COVID and they need a test, is what she's saying. So as a paediatrician or as a parent, unfortunately, there really aren't any specific symptoms that will definitely tell you whether your child has COVID-19 or any other winter viruses. So get them a test. But when it comes to deciding... Some, oh, I was going to say, yeah, is there so, anything you can rule out then? You know, because if they don't have this, then it's likely not to be. So, unfortunately not. But what the government have done is given us three testing criteria that are the reasons why you should get a coronavirus test. And they've chosen these symptoms not because they're the only symptoms of coronavirus in children or in adults, but because they think that these are the best symptoms to make coronavirus more likely, although it's still very unlikely in children, because most children are just going to have the other winter viruses. I mean, she's contradicting herself all the way through the interview. This is staggering stuff, you know. She's agreeing with Tim Spector on the one hand, and then she's saying, well, they need to be tested. Symptoms of coronavirus in children or in adults, but because they think that these are the best 
symptoms to make coronavirus more likely, although it's still very unlikely in children, because most children are just going to have the other winter viruses. It's still very unlikely in children. Most children will have the other winter viruses. Viruses. And those three symptoms are fever. So if your child has a temperature measured at 37 eighth or above, or if your child feels very hot to touch, then whether they've got a fever and a runny nose or a fever and diarrhoea, you need to get a test and you need to self-isolate. And the other symptom is, key symptom is cough. So if your child is coughing a lot over an hour, or if they've had three or more episodes in 24 hours of shorter episodes of coughing. If they've coughed three or four times in a 24-hour period, they should be tested for COVID. When the epidemiologist, who's forgotten more about viruses than the paediatrician, who's basically just a mouthpiece for Big Pharma, what the paediatrician does is she sees children presenting with symptoms on any day of the week. She then inputs the symptoms into a keyboard, into a computer, and she gets a result and a recommended medication. She's not a doctor, really. Not the way... Vernon Coleman practiced medicine, not the way Audrey Farrell in Waterford practiced medicine, my family GP. So if they've coughed more than three times in a 24-hour period, get him tested. And she was brought on today to specifically refute what Tim Spector said yesterday, which they hated him saying, which is that you don't shouldn't be testing children at all. Whatever a child is presenting with is extremely unlikely that they have COVID-19. He said clearly. Couldn't have been any more straightforward. But the BBC had to repair that damage. So they bring on a paediatrician that nobody's ever heard of to kind of muddy the waters and say, oh, well, you know, coughing a couple of times in a a day, you better bring your children in. There's a number of reasons they're doing that. One of them, of course, is they want to terrorise children. It's part of their plan. is to scare the absolute bejesus out of the children of this country change the way they see the world and view the world, change their behaviours. That's the BBC in action today. I'm not going to mention defund the BBC. I'm not going to mention it. I'm not going to get into it today because I'm running out of time. It's coming up for 29 minutes to 5, so I'm going to bid you good day. Thank you for listening to this today. I'll be back with you on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. That's the UK time for Sunday View, where we'll look through the newspapers, we'll listen to the uh, Sophie Ridge programme, we'll have a listen to Andrew Marr as well. We'll have analysis of all of that on Sunday. Monday's programme brings the Dr Vernon Coleman in the first hour, of course, half five. Uh, That's a regular feature now, I'm delighted to say. And David Vance will be on with me in hour two on Monday. I have a really busy week next week. Mark Windows from Windows on the World. Can't wait for Mark to come back. It's been over a year since he was on the programme. You have yourself a lovely weekend. Thanks for your company this afternoon. And as I always say, look after yourselves and one another. I've been the BBG. Don't forget if you missed any of the programmes during the week, catch up with them on YouTube, Spotify, Podomatic.com, iTunes. Ah, they're everywhere. The Richie Allen radio shows. They're everywhere. I'm going to have a cold beer now. I think I've earned it. Have a fantastic weekend. Bye from me.